Doesn't he see how much I put in the offering plate? It was quite an impressive amount. Why doesn't God notice me? Everyone else knows what good work I'm doing. I've received numerous awards. Why doesn't God notice us? We're nice people. We have a nice church. Just look, our calendar is full of activity. Surely God paid attention to that. Why doesn't God notice us? Look at all we have done for God, built for God, donated for God, said on behalf of God. We're always talking about him and saying things in his name. Did God forget about us? I'm confused. I don't feel God's presence in the way that I used to. I don't know what's missing. Has God forsaken us? My world is changing. I don't know what to do. I'm scared of what will happen. If you heard yourself in any of those questions or in any of those responses, good news. You're still human this morning. You're human today in the same way that the Israelites were human. That's who the prophet Isaiah is speaking to in the text that Pastor Veronica read. The Israelites are confused and angry and unsure. They're trying so hard to get close to God. So hard to do the right thing. They're really missing more. You see, the people, they think that they figured it out. They think that they understood God's commandments. They are pious. They wear the right garments. They go through all the right steps. They even make themselves physically uncomfortable by abstaining from food, rightly, and according to God's laws. And they do all of this, but over time, they start to get confused because they're having a problem. The problem of God's Silence. If they're doing everything right, why can't they hear God's voice? If they're doing everything right, then why doesn't God notice? They wonder. Well, luckily for the Israelites and for us, God does notice. God is paying attention even when we think that God isn't. God sees the Israelites clear as day. God just isn't all that impressed with their behavior. So God sends a prophet, as God often does when her people are missing the mark. And now Isaiah, Isaiah is not a gentle messenger. Isaiah doesn't dance around the issue. He is direct and he lays it out for the Israelites. You fast, yes, but then you go and you point fingers at one another. You try to embrace humility by putting on that sackcloth, but then you're violent. You worship and worship and worship, but then you exploit your employees and you ignore slavery and you do absolutely nothing about poverty and homelessness. Isaiah is keeping it real with the Israelites. Just like the prophet Amos in last week's sermon, Isaiah tells the people what it is that God wants. And guess what? It's not their worship. That's right. You heard it here. God doesn't really care about any of this. At least not on its own. Not if it's just a rote thing that the Israelites do or that we do. God doesn't want ritual, doesn't want worship, doesn't want beautiful, shiny offering plates and stained glass windows and our Sunday best if, if it doesn't make a difference. God doesn't want our worship. If it doesn't do anything for our hearts and our souls and the world around us. And that's a hard pill to swallow. I don't know if you noticed, but I'm a pastor. I'm one of your pastors, actually, which means that I spend a great deal of time thinking about worship and ritual and offering plates and choral anthems and liturgy and prayer and mix selections and homiletics, which is just a fancy word for preaching style. I spend time during the week thinking about things that you might not even notice. I think about how 
we should give announcements. I think about punctuation in the bulletin. I think about the acoustics of this space. I think a great deal about candles. <laughs> and most of the time, I enjoy thinking about all these things. I want everyone to come to worship and feel moved and inspired and nourished. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Sunday morning, this time, right here, it's one of my favorite times of the week. But none of that matters. I'm wasting my time if worship doesn't touch our hearts and if it doesn't change our behavior. It doesn't matter if we're just going through the motions or if we're doing it for show. It's no secret that mainline Protestant churches are experiencing a bit of a decline. Right? Church attendance is not what it used to be. That's a fact. That's true of this church. It's true of churches across the United States. And that's painful. That's even scary. Especially for those of us who have cherished church memories and traditions, who have grown up in these spaces. And people ask me about this decline all the time. I'm sure that lots of pastors get that question. So here's my take. I don't think there's any one singular answer for why it's happening. And I don't think that it's all a bad thing. That's a different sermon. I do think that some of the decline in church attendance, some of it, is because we're human. And we missed the mark. I think that we, as contemporary Christians, as the church with like a capital C, got ourselves into a situation similar to that of the Israelites in the book of Isaiah. And now that we're in that situation, we have to listen to the prophets. Yes, this, this time we're living in, it's a prophetic time. Make no mistake. This is a time when the church at large is being told it's out of whack. And is being told that it has a chance to really do something. And this isn't being said by just one singular voice. We don't have an individual prophet like Isaiah. All that would be pretty cool if it happened. But it is being said by the actions and voices of hundreds, even thousands of people. Young people. People on the margins are queer siblings. People of all backgrounds who say, church didn't welcome me. It's hypocritical. It's no longer a place where I feel like I can fit. And just like Isaiah, all of these people, they'll tell you this truth directly if you ask. Or if you stop long enough to listen. And ironically, the reasons are largely the same as they are in Isaiah. So many people, you can go online, you can Google, you can read articles and blog posts and essays of people saying there's a mismatch between Sunday morning worship, what we say and do in this space, and how Christians behave out in the world. Let's look at some examples. I read this week that in the last six months, only 25% of preachers mentioned mass incarceration from the and when you ask only white preachers, that goes down to zero percent. Zero percent. Is this the fast that I choose, says God, to never mention the 2.3 million of my children who are behind bars in the United States? Or the fact that the church is uncomfortable talking honestly about drug use? Even though many states, ours included, have legalized recreational marijuana. Even though one in three people know someone who is struggling with an opioid addiction. One in three. I'm one of those three. One of those one in three I know people. And yet I'll be honest, I don't remember the last time I talked about that in church. At least not with someone other than Al, of course, who is our resident expert on that. Is this the fast that I choose, says God, that what is for good or ill such a central part of modern life, something that impacts the lives of one-third of the people living in this country will be off-limits in the moment? We could consider the church's 
control and climate change. Climate change is impacting every living being on this planet, whether we admit it or not. And as it continues, those who are going to be most harmed are the people the Bible tells us explicitly to care for. The poor, the most vulnerable. Christianity has the voice and the platform and, my God, the theological basis to make a real impact on this, but has largely decided to sit by in willful ignorance or fear. Is this the fast I choose? Says God that my people stand by while my beautiful creation is ravaged for profit? That humans, those I call to be stewards of creation, ignore the dire warnings of scientists and fail to hold those in power to account? Or what about how we treat one? Did you know that 50% of people, only 50% say that they have a meaningful connection with someone every day? Half of the population is desperately lonely. Statistically, that means every other person in this room feels really, really alone. And yet, too often people come to church and they feel they can't be themselves. People come to church and they aren't accepted. People come to church and we don't honor them and their unique identity and voices and they still feel lonely. Is this the fast that I choose, says God? That we would gossip behind one another's backs and point fingers? That we would make one another feel small and lesser than? No. No. That is not the fast. <clears throat> Worship is at the heart of what we do. It has been the central act of the church since its beginning, but it misses the mark if it fails to impact our being and our relationships and our behavior. I'm not saying we should quit worship, okay? <laughs> I'm not saying that our traditions don't matter, or that you shouldn't give up something for Lent, or that you shouldn't show up for choir practice next Sunday, okay? Choir, I'm not saying but I am saying that our worship should not be in service of our egos or our status. Our worship is for God, right? And the worship that God desires is a worship that does something, that has an impact. In Matthew 5, Jesus talks about salt and light. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world, he says. The church has to remember that. We need to stay salty. The fast that God chooses is a salty one. And what does salt do? We talked about this. It gives flavor. It brings up the best in one's food. Without it, a meal is flat and boring. Have you ever had a meal that just lacked taste? I know we all have it. some potluck or something along the way. We had a dish that did not have enough salt. And how was it? How did it taste? Not great. Salty worship, it has flavor. It brings out our best. It encourages us to be good to ourselves and to one another. It incorporates all the aspects of our lives and into the world around us, the good and the bad, the scary and the messy parts too. It lets God in to really be a part of us. One of the most memorable and salty worship experiences I ever had was back at my church in New York City. And every year they do a worship service the same weekend as Gay Pride in the city. It's a worship service that centers the lives and voices of the LGBTQIA community. And part of the service on this one day was a performance by a congregant who is also a drag queen. And she got up behind the pulpit and sang, I am what I am. And if you're unfamiliar, the lyrics go, I am what I am. I don't want praise. I don't want pity. I bang my own drum. Some think, some think it's noise. I think it's pretty. And so what if I love each sparkle and each bangle? Why not try to see things from a different angle? Your Life is a sham till you can shout, I am what I am. It was exuberant. It was 
surprising. I've certainly never seen that in worship before. It was not what you would expect coming to Sunday morning service, but that's exactly what made it salty. It took the life of what was happening in that city and it put it right front and center. And I have to say, she was preaching. That two minute performance was a masterclass in letting one's light shine. The queen was showing us how to lift that basket right off of our individual lights and let them shine for all to see, regardless of what others might think. It was amazing. It was sacred. It was salty, salty worship. And of course, of course, being salty is a challenge, right? It's so easy to stay in our comfort zone. We don't like to rock the boat. We don't want to offend or mess something up. Salt pushes us to be real, to show up with our real concerns and real flaws and real selves. But if we are the salt of the earth, that's what we must do. Church, we have to rise to the challenge or else, as Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, we will lose our flavor and we won't be useful and we will be cast out. I don't want that to happen. And I don't believe that it will happen in this place. But we do have to continue to push ourselves to work on it. And if that sounds hard, Here's the good, encouraging news. Salt doesn't just add flavor, right? It also preserves. It's paradoxical, but the salt that challenges is also the salt that preserves. Our capacity to take risks is exactly what will keep us vibrant. Our ability to accept change is what will keep us relevant. Our willingness to be vulnerable with one another is exactly what will help us to feel more and more alive as people and as a church. God always knows us, salty or not. But let's strive for a worship that is pleasing to God, that is flavorful for God. Let's not be bland popcorn worship for God, right? Let's be worth our salt. Let's be worth our salt. Amen. Amen. Amen.